This movie describes a study titled Optogenetic Stimulation of a Hippocampal Engram Activates Fear Memory Recall. The paper was published in Nature in 2012. This is the first of two studies which deal with the neural basis of memory and show that a memory can be reactivated by stimulating the population of neurons that originally encoded the memory. This study, and the one in the following movie, are not only of exceptional importance, but are also remarkable, as we shall see. The basic idea is that a particular memory is encoded and stored as an engram by a sparse population of neurons in the hippocampus. By sparse, I mean that only a small number of neurons out of a much, much larger population of hippocampal neurons actually encodes and stores a particular memory. Here, the investigators show that they can elicit a specific memory, a fear memory, by directly activating the population of neurons that was active during learning and presumably encodes that memory. This is a very cool, really a remarkable study, but it requires some lengthy introduction to explain how they actually activated a small population of neurons and how they could directly reactivate that specific population of neurons. The study was conducted in the hippocampus of mice. The hippocampus is known to be important for the formation and storage of memories. Also shown here is another nucleus called the amygdala. The amygdala also plays a role in memory storage, but its primary role is in evoking emotions, especially fear. We will deal with the amygdala, memory, and fear in the following movie. For now, I'd like you to know that the amygdala is connected to the hippocampus, and the hippocampus is connected to the amygdala, all through reciprocal connections. So here is the general strategy of the experiment. One, we subject mice to fear conditioning, which activates a small neuronal population in the hippocampus, those those are the hippocampal neurons that presumably encode the fear memory. Two, we label the activated population with both a yellow fluorescent protein and channel rhodopsin 2. There they are, they're labeled. Three, we insert a laser activated light guide into the hippocampus. And four, we activate the transfected neurons with blue light and evoke the fear memory. There they are. So the hippocampal neurons that encode the fear memory fire and will evoke the fear response. That is the whole idea of this experiment in a nutshell. But two strategic questions have to be addressed before we consider the actual data. The first is, how can a population of cells that are active during a particular behavior, in this case during fear conditioning, be selectively labeled? And second, how can one uniquely stimulate those cells and not all the others? First, I'll describe how the investigators labeled the hippocampal cells that were active during fear conditioning, and then we'll turn how they could be uniquely stimulated. The first thing that's needed is a gene that is turned on by neuronal activity, that is by action potentials. That gene is CFOS, a member of a family of immediate early genes, which is turned on by neuronal activity. The CFOS gene produces a product, but the product is irrelevant to us. What is important is the CFOS promoter, which is then joined to a gene called the tetracycline transactivator, or TTA. When CFOS is activated, it drives the tetracycline transactivator, that is the TTA gene, 
which produces a protein that is a transcription factor. But CFOS mice can be purchased from companies that genetically engineer mice so that they have CFOS tetracycline transactivator constructs in all of their neurons. Well, that's fine so far, but now we need an other construct one that will be activated by the transcription factor produced by the tetracycline transactivator, that is, the TTA. That additional construct has to have a gene for channel rhodopsin 2, abbreviated CHR2, a microbial rhodopsin that has a pore permeable to sodium ions. The pore opens when stimulated with blue light, thereby exciting neurons and causing them to generate action potentials. Driving neuronal activity with light by activating channel rhodopsins is known as optogenetics. For optogenetic studies, neuroscientists insert the channel rhodopsin genes into brain cells but with an engineered virus. The channel rhodopsin 2 gene is fused with the gene for yellow fluorescent protein. Thus, investigators can see the neurons when they light up the fluorescent protein and then trigger neuronal activity by activating the channel rhodopsin with light. Here, the fused channel rhodopsin and yellow fluorescent protein gene is combined with the tetracycline responsive promoter, abbreviated TRE. Thus, the cells transfected with this construct will only express the channel rhodopsin and the yellow fluorescent protein when the promoter is activated by tetracycline. And I'm going to return to that in just a moment because it's very important. The modified gene is then inserted into a virus, which is then injected into the hippocampus of a mouse. So now we have mice with brains that are genetically engineered so that all of their neurons have CFOS tetracycline activated constructs. So the next question is, how do we get the viral constructs into the brain? And the answer is, we take an electrode, and we fill that electrode with the viral construct. We take that electrode and insert it into the hippocampus, inject the viral construct into the hippocampus, and now the hippocampal cells are transfected with the viral construct. Indeed, now only hippocampal cells have both the CFOS TTA construct and the TRE channel rhodopsin 2 yellow fluorescent protein construct. Next, let's explore how these constructs actually work in the transfective mice. One key component is whether the antibiotic tetracycline is or is not present. This is a new twist. Investigators actually use doxycycline, which is given in the mouse's food supply, because it is more effective than the tetracycline. Now, let's see how all of this spins together. So now, let's see what happens when no doxycycline is present, indicated no dox, D-O-X. So here are the major players. So in the top left, is the CFOS promoter TTA construct, which of course is genetically endowed within the cells of the mouse because they were programmed that way or engineered that way. On the bottom right are neurons in the hippocampus, and at the left is the viral construct showing the tray TRE promoter site that's coupled and drives the channel rhodopsin 2 gene and the yellow fluorescent protein gene. All right, now let's see what happens when there's neuronal activity. So there's neural firing, it turns on the C4 promoter, a lot of neurons in the hippocampus are 
active. There's trans transcription of the tetracycline transactivator gene, and that produces a product. There's the product. The product migrates down binds to the tray promoter site, turning on and driving the canalotoxin 2 gene and the yellow fluorescent protein gene. And they then are expressed in the hippocampal neurons that were active. Next, let's see what happens when doxycycline is present. Now we stimulate the cells again, the normal firing plan is in force. We have the transcription of the tetracycline transactivator gene, but it then binds to doxycycline, the product binds. And as a consequence of the binding, the product becomes inactivated or deactivated. So now, when it tries to bind to the promoter site and tray, it can't do so. And as a consequence, there's no transcription of the channel channel rhodopsin 2 gene, nor of the yellow fluorescent protein gene, and the active neurons, therefore, do not express either channel rhodopsin 2 or the yellow fluorescent protein. Now for the actual experiment. The first thing they did was to put the mice in a compartment each day for five days. Doxycycline was provided in their food. And remember, the doxycycline prevents the transcription of channel rhodopsin 2 and yellow fluorescent protein. Each day they were presented with epics of optical stimulation with blue light. That is, the light was turned on, then turned off, then turned on, then turned off. This is called habituation. The mice did not react to the blue light. That is, they did not freeze when the light came on. When the brains in a few of the mice were sectioned and studied, the neurons did not express yellow fluorescent protein or channel rhodopsin 2. After the five days of habituation, the mice were given a diet that contained no doxycycline for one day and then put back into the compartment. During this entire period, they were never given doxycycline. Now they were subjected to fear conditioning. The fear conditioning was produced by periodically presenting tones, and each time the tone came on, a shock was also applied to their feet, like that. Each time the mice were shocked, they froze. The act of freezing was taken to mean that the mice experienced fear. This condition is called the experimental condition. Some mice were sacrificed immediately after the fear conditioning, and their brains displayed a small number of cells that contained yellow fluorescent protein and channel rhodopsin 2. Those neurons presumably represent the encoding of the fear memory. Now comes the critical test. The mice were placed back on doxycycline to prevent additional cells from expressing channel rhodopsin 2 and yellow fluorescent protein. They were then placed back into the compartment for five additional days. Each day they were presented with epics of optical stimulation on and off and on and off again. Now the mice froze when the optical stimulation was on but not when it was off. The freezing when white went on was observed in each of the five days of testing. Thus, the neurons activated during fear conditioning are reactivated by optical stimulation and evoke the fear memory. So in other words, the interpretation that the authors gave to this data is that the cells that were labeled during fear conditioning define the active neuronal population, and that subsequent reactivation of that population was sufficient to cause the mouse to recall the fear memory. And that is the main point of the study. However, the authors also wanted to rule out the possibility 
that post-training freezing by optical stimulation was only due to the activation of hippocampal cells unrelated to fear learning. Therefore, the investigators conducted two additional control experiments. In the first control experiment, mice were put through the same protocol as the experimental mice that were just described, except there was no shock given when the tone was presented. The mice went through the same habituation protocol with a doxycycline diet as the mice did in the experimental group. Following habituation, the rats were again taken off doxy doxycycline and placed in the same chamber as during habituation. They were again presented with tones, but no shocks were given. Of course, the mice did not freeze when the tones were presented. Examination of the brains of some of these control mice showed that the same number of hippocampal cells expressed yellow fluorescent protein and channel rhodopsin 2 as in the experimental group. Presumably, these represented a different subpopulation of neurons than those expressing yellow fluorescent protein and channel rhodopsin 2 after tones were paired with shocks, even though the numbers were the same. The mice were then taken off doxycycline and tested for five days with optical stimulation. Even though the tonal stimulation in the absence of doxycycline caused some hippocampal cells to express yellow fluorescent protein and channel rhodopsin 2, stimulation of those cells with blue light did not evoke freezing. The interpretation is that the subset of cells activated by light were not the subset that represented a fear memory and thus did not evoke fear. The results show then that freezing observed in the first experimental group required optimal optical activation of a specific subset of hippocampal neurons that are associated with fear conditioning. In the control experiment, in contrast, it activated a population of hippocampal cells that were not associated with fear conditioning, and thus the activation of those cells did not evoke fear and freezing. In the second control, mice were transfected with a viral construct that only had the yellow fluorescent protein gene, but did not have a channel rhodopsin gene. These mice were then put through the same protocol as the experimental mice, and they were presented with a tone and a shock. As in the first control, the mice went through the habituation protocol with a doxycycline diet. They then were taken off doxycycline and underwent fear conditioning in the experimental chamber. This time, however, shocks were presented together with tones. This protocol caused the neurons that encode the fear memory to be labeled with yellow fluorescent protein. The mice were then taken off doxycycline and tested for five days with optical stimulation. The optical stimulation did not evoke freezing because the cells labeled with yellow fluorescent protein did not contain channel rhodopsin and thus were not activated by the light stimulation and thus the optical stimulation did not reactivate the fear memory. Thus the fear conditioning by itself was not sufficient for the reactivation of the fear memory. Rather, the specific set of cells that represent the fear memory had to be reactivated in order to evoke fear, and in this case, they couldn't because they did not contain channel rhodopsin. So there are three conclusions to this study. First, the authors could actually tag with a fluorescent protein and thereby visualize the specific subset of hippocampal cells that encodes a memory, a fear memory in this case. Two, they could then reactivate that specific subpopulation of cells with optical stimulation and cause the memory to be recalled, which I find to be absolutely stunning. And three, they also showed 
that it is, it is the specific subpopulation of hippocampal cells that encodes the memory that had to be activated. If the memory had never been formed, then activating the same number of cells in a different subpopulation of hippocampal cells was without effect.